All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you are doing uh, doing well. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be continuing our study in the Psalms, so we'll be in Psalm chapter 6. If you have a copy of God's Word, I would invite you to go ahead and uh, open to it. Uh, as you are turning, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray for us and ask God's blessing upon our Bible study tonight. Our Father in Heaven, God, we come to you today, and Lord, we are thankful for the salvation that we have received through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we are thankful that our salvation is not based on our own righteousness or based on anything that we could do for you, but our salvation is based on the completed uh, work of Christ on our behalf. Father, we pray today that you would forgive our sins, that you would cleanse our hearts and minds, that you would cleanse us from all iniquity. And Father, we pray that as we have opened our Bibles together, you would open our hearts and open our minds to understand what your word says in Psalm chapter 6. Father, we know that you are sovereign. We know that you are good. And Father, we know that you uh, care for us. And God, we know that your will for us is our sanctification. And so, Father, we pray to that end. We pray that your word would accomplish exactly what you have for it to accomplish for us or in us today. And Father, we pray that on the uh, the other side of this Bible study, that we would look more like Jesus. God, we pray that you would shape our minds and our hearts and mold us into the image of Christ. Father, we pray for your guidance tonight. God, we pray that through your Spirit, we might be able to understand this psalm in a fresh way. Help us to see the beauty in your law. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm chapter 6, we'll be studying it tonight. This is sort of an individual expression of lament on David's part. Uh, this psalm is uh, perhaps best understood not so much by the theological content or even uh, the insights that can be gleaned from a Bible study like tonight, but maybe it's best understood when a person has experienced the type of experience that the psalmist is experienced, experiencing. We will see as we go through this, this suffering that he is experiencing is long-suffering. Uh, that it affects every part of his person. So it's not just physical or emotional or spiritual that he, he is being affected by whatever this is in his whole person. It is a suffering that is being made worse by those around him, whether they are openly hostile towards David or they are maybe those miserable comforters, right? Those who are failing miserable as they are, miserably as they are trying to comfort him uh, in his affliction, uh, sort of like the Psalms, I mean, the Friends of Job, rather. Uh, and this psalm, uh, by the early church, was understood as a uh, penitential psalm. It would be a psalm of repentance. This psalm would be something like Psalm 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. Uh, this is possible, uh, but there's no explicit mention of David's sin or of repentance in this psalm. So it's sort of broad and ambiguous, and I think it's broad and ambiguous enough that it's a psalm of lament that can fit any number of trials and struggles. And I think that God has done this in His grace. You know, we must understand that uh, while this psalm is a psalm of David, right, uh, this is also a psalm where God is giving to us uh, words that we can express to Him. So think about it like this. Like, our human experience is full of a broad range of emotions. So we are, at times we are on the mountaintop, at times we are uh, in the valley, sometimes we feel numb, and other times we are feeling uh, great trials and tribulations in our life, right? We understand that throughout this life we have this broad range of emotions that we feel. And God in His grace throughout the Psalms has allowed the Psalms of Lament, like this one, to be a vehicle of expression for us, for His people, to express to Him when things are not how they should be. And so this kind of sort of answers the question, like what sort of thing can somebody sing when they are down, right? Whenever things are not going the way that they should. You know, many people think, well, we just need to gloss over everything that we feel, right? We just need to sort of gloss over, grin and bear it, and we'll just do the best, right? We just present ourselves as people who are unmoved and unshaken by anything, and that's the way to go. But what we find in the Psalms is that the human heart, the human emotion, the human experience, the experience of God's people, it's much more multifaceted than that. And so Psalms of Lament are a grace that God has given us to be a vehicle for us to express our emotions. So we need to remember that David is the author of this psalm, and he is praying these things to God. But remember that God the Holy Spirit 
is inspiring these truths. All scripture is breathed out by God. So these Psalms, yes, David is expressing them to God, but they're inspired by the Spirit. So these Psalms then become God's word to us, God's word to us, to present back to Him to express the way that we are feeling. And this is the way that people have used these Psalms since they were written from the beginning. So let's read Psalm chapter 6, and then we'll begin to walk through this. David says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you, and she, O who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of my grief. It grows weak because of all of my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. And all my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. All right, so the first thing that we see in this psalm is that David is asking for God's grace instead of discipline, or maybe even in the midst of discipline. And this is what has led many people, specifically the early church, to see this as a penitential psalm that David maybe is repenting, or he knows that his sin is causing these things, and that is possible. David may be experiencing God's discipline over some sin in his life, or at least from his perspective, his sin may be causing uh, his grief, right? Now, I want to say something about that from just from, from a, a biblical understanding of discipline. God will indeed discipline us in our sins. But remember that God's discipline for His children is always redemptive. It's always purposeful. This is what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7, and then verse 11. And here he's quoting in the first part from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then listen. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by him. So the author of Hebrews in the New Testament is picking up from Proverbs chapters 3, verse 11 and 12, and he is applying these things to believers in the New Covenant. He's saying, listen, you are experiencing this discipline, but don't regard it lightly. Like, understand that the discipline of the Lord, he's doing this because he loves you like a father loves his son. Listen, discipline seems bad for the moment, but remember, remember that in the end you will be uh, righteous. It will produce this, uh, this peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by God's discipline. And so perhaps David is experiencing God's discipline for some sin in his life, or at least maybe from David's perspective, he thinks that God is disciplining him for some sin in his life. But it's also possible that David is just experiencing some kind of injustice in his life. Some people say this is a, a sickness, which is very possible. Uh, many of the things point to that, but it's also possible that he's speaking metaphorically about uh, the great extent of his suffering. It could be a situation that is causing his whole life to be in pain and sorrow. And we all know that, that there are many things in the, in the human experience that can cause us to grieve our entire beings, even if those things are not necessarily physical. But notice a few things about this. Notice that David, even in the midst of all of this, still affirms God's sovereign hand even in the midst of what he is suffering. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that David believes that God is ultimately in control of his suffering, and yet he is still coming to God and asking for grace. God is still sovereign in our suffering. Look who he's going to. He's coming to God, and he's asking God, God, do not rebuke me in your anger. Don't discipline me in your wrath. And there's sort of a progression here. Don't rebuke me with your, with your words. Don't speak ill to me in your wrath. But don't discipline me that's physically in your wrath. So don't, 
speak ill words to me. Don't don't physically assault me in your wrath. And he says, God, be gracious to me. And and I wonder if he's saying like, God, please, like I, I am I am asking you here, don't don't come against me with these things. Like I am your enemy, God. Come to me like a son. Be gracious to me because I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. And then look at the end. He says, but you, O Lord, and then he sort of just breaks off. How long? Like how long? Then I start, turn, O Lord, deliver my life. So he acknowledges that God is, is sovereign over his suffering, but he's still coming to God and asking for Asking for grace. And I want to say a couple of things about this. The first thing is, is that it is comforting for Christians to know that God is ultimately sovereign over our suffering. And the reason why I say that it is comforting is because if our suffering is by chance or our suffering doesn't have any purpose behind it, then it is very difficult for us to endure that type of suffering. But if we understand that ultimately God is sovereign over our suffering and that God is purposeful in our suffering then we can understand or it makes us be able it enables us to be able to stand up under it this is a grace of God to know that God is is sovereign over our suffering but the second thing that I want us to say is that is not the same thing that is saying that God is the author of suffering and evil right this is not to say that God is the author to say that God uses our pain or suffering or the evil in this world for his purposes is not the same thing as saying that God causes evil or suffering in this world. And we'll look at that towards the end. But notice here that David's suffering is real. I don't want to minimize this for a moment. His suffering is real, it's not imagined, and it is intense. It may not be exactly what he's saying literally. He may not really have a problem with his bones, right? This may not be the picture that we have. He may not have a bone disease. But the point is, is that he is trying to show that his pain is affecting his whole per person. And I just want to remind you that suffering in this life is not fake. Right? There are many, there are many different religions, there are many different worldviews out there that say that suffering is just sort of an experience of the mind that doesn't actually exist. Listen, the Bible is very clear that we are going to experience suffering in this world. It makes no bones about it. So notice what David says about his suffering. Well, the first thing that he says in verse 2, specifically at the end here, Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. He, he is expressing at least that his pain is physical. His pain is physical, but it's not just physical. Look in verse 3. My soul also is greatly troubled. So his pain is physical, but it's also emotional and spiritual. His suffering at the end of verse 3 is not temporary. He says, Lord... How long? Like, how much longer am I going to have to endure this? So his suffering is physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's long-standing, and his pain is made worse by his foes. Look what he says in verse 7. My eye where it wastes away because of my grief, it grows weak because of all of my foes. So we put all that together. He is suffering physically, he's suffering emotionally and spiritually. His suffering is extending beyond the scope of what he thinks he can endure, and his suffering is made worse by those around him. I wonder if you've ever found yourself in that place. I wonder if maybe you have suffered emotionally to the point where it feels like your, your pain is physical, or maybe you are suffering physically. You've suffered physically for so long that it is affecting you emotionally and spiritually. It is going on beyond what what the scope of what you think you can endure is. And, and perhaps your suffering is even being made worse by those around you. Maybe it's your enemies or maybe it's your, your friends who are offering you terrible advice or terrible comfort. Like, like oh, God won't give you more than you can handle. Or, or this is just God's way of pruning you. Like those things, those things are, are, are helpful in some instance. But listen, whenever we are in the depth of suffering, sometimes we just need to go to God. And exactly like David does, perhaps this is you today and you are saying, like, God, how long, how long am I going to have to endure this? And so this psalm, this psalm from the very beginning is giving us a vehicle for us to express to God our feelings, our emotions, our fears, our anxieties, our pleas for mercy, whenever we are experiencing physical, emotional, spiritual pain that is long and it's 
its its scope, or at least it feels long. This is giving us a vehicle, and I want you to see God's grace in that. God has not left us without words to express to, and we know that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. We understand that we know that Christ is our advocate, but right here in Psalm chapter 6, we see that God is giving us words to express how we are feeling whenever we are not feeling like we should. So the second thing is, is that David asks for deliverance, but it is based on God's covenant, covenantal steadfast love. Look what he says in verses 4 through 5. He says, Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me, look at this, for the sake of your steadfast love. Verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you, and she only will give you praise. David is appealing here to two things in this section for God to turn and deliver him. The first is, God's steadfast love. Now, this is a term that we have talked about a few different times uh, over the weeks as we've been studying these psalms. It's the term has said, and it is God's covenantal, his steadfast love or faithfulness. We've discussed this, but he is appealing to God based on God's faithfulness. And it could also be pointing to David appealing to God based on God's covenant faithfulness. Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Remember, this is the Davidic covenant. This is what God promised to David. David wanted to build God a house, but God turns and says, No, no, I will build you a house, speaking of a dynasty uh, for King David, that his sons would be on the throne. And this is what he says about, about his son. This is part of the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel seven fourteen. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now he is talking about his offspring specifically, but he's talking about the anointed one. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But listen, but my steadfast love, my chesed, will not depart from him. So perhaps David, in a sense, is appealing to what God has already revealed to David in the Davidic covenant, that God has said that God's steadfast love would not depart from the house of David. And so David is saying, listen, God, turn and deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. So in a very real sense, either way, David is appealing to God, to who God is and what God has said for deliverance. Don't miss that. David is not making pleas based on who he thinks God is. He is not making pleas based on what he thinks God has to do for him. He is making pleas based on who God is. He is steadfast. He is loving towards his people who God is, and what God has said. And the second thing that he is appealing to is God's glory. So if the first thing he's doing is appealing to God's chesed, his steadfast love, the second thing that he's doing is appealing to God's, appealing to God's glory. Now this is a strange way for us, uh, for us to read this. It's strange, it sounds strange to our ears. But in David's mind, this is what he's saying. He says, For in death there is no remembrance of you, and she only will give you praise. Now he doesn't have the fullest understanding of the afterlife like like we do. They, they thought of Sheol, they thought of this as sort of this uh, shadowy underworld where people would go. And, and it's implicit throughout the Old Testament. I'm not saying that resurrection or that afterlife is not implicit throughout the Old Testament. It is. But here he is just saying something like, in David's mind, Lord, if I die, who will there be to praise you? Or if you do not deliver me, then how will people praise you for my deliverance? So David is saying to God, Lord, if you deliver me, then I will praise you on the earth. If you kill me, how will I praise you? If you deliver me, how will I praise you on the earth? If you kill me, how will I praise you on this earth? There will be nobody here praising you for what you have done. This is sort of the same thing that he says in Psalm chapter 51. This is a, a, this is a penitential psalm. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. So he asks for deliverance. And he says, Lord, if you deliver me, I will sing aloud of your righteousness. Lord, if you open my lips, I will declare your praise. Now, as Christians, we understand through the fullness of God's uh, revelation, His progressive revelation throughout the entire canon of Scripture, we understand that there are myriads and myriads of people who are praising God after death, right? Everyone who is united to Christ by faith is right now praising the Father uh, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are praising God in the heavenly places. But for David, he is basing his prayer here on who he knows God is. He is asking based on God's grace. He knows that any hope that he has of deliverance in any, any, in any way, whether that be spiritual or physical, 
is going to be found because of God's grace, because of God's will. He is asking God to move based on God's grace and God's glory. Now, a whole sermon could be preached on that, but we must move on. Look what else David does. Immediately after, he asks for this, this compassion. He asks for the Lord to deliver him based on his grace or his steadfast love. Then he, David honestly expresses his emotional state to the Lord in verses 6 through 7. Look what he says. I am weary with my moaning, and every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of my grief, and it grows weak because of all my foes. Notice that David does not try to hide his emotional state from God. He honestly expresses it to him. Now, I want to remind you, I know I just said it, but I want to remind you that yes, David is praying this to God, but remember, the Holy Spirit is inspiring this psalm. And so, yes, this is a prayer of David, but remember, this is God's word to us for us to express back to him. And that's crucial. He's basically saying here, I am crying all day, I am crying all night, and my enemies are making things worse for me. So God is giving us this to be able to express to Him. Now this touches on a few different things. It touches on God's omniscience and His goodness. Now why am I saying it touches on God's omniscience? Well, it's because of the way that most Christians hide their true feelings from God. It's because they forget about God's omniscience. I want to tell you this. It is no use for us to try to hide our true emotions and feelings from God. Let me say that again. It is of no use for us to try to hide our true emotions and our feelings from God. Now, I want to be careful here. This is no excuse for us to be sinful. So we don't come to God in our anger and blaspheme. We don't come to God in our anger and sin. We don't come to God in our anger and accuse or malign or speak ill of God against his character. We don't do those things. But it is not helpful for us to try to hide our emotions, the way that we're feeling about things, from a God who knows every single thing about us. And this is God giving us this to show us that it is fine for us to be honest with God about how we are feeling. Because, I mean, be honest with yourself, Christian. God already knows God already knows how you're feeling about a situation. If you're suffering, God knows you're suffering. But God also cares. God knows, but God also cares. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Listen. Casting all your anxieties on Him. Did you hear that? Casting all your anxieties on Him. Him. Now, isn't that the same thing Jesus said? Don't be anxious about anything, right? Paul tells us don't be anxious about anything, but pray about all things at all times with thanksgiving. And so this is something that runs throughout, right? Cast all your anxieties on Him. So come to God with your anxieties. Give them over to Him. Give your fears, your emotions over to God. Be honest about these things. Why? Because He cares for you. Because He cares for you. In some ways, we can see this even in Psalm chapter 6, as God has given us these words as a vehicle to express our emotions. And so then David not only expresses his emotions honestly, then David turns, and it's sort of a, a shift, right? We can get whiplash from this, right? He, he sort of shifts from this, I am crying all night, I'm crying all day, my eyes are wasting away because of my grief, and because of my foes. And then he turns immediately. It's like he stops talking to the Lord honestly and openly and like this. And he turns from the Lord. He turns almost like turning to his enemies here. And he warns them. So David confidently and boldly affirms that God has heard and God has accepted his prayer. Listen. He says, Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord, the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. Now look at that. He repeats it three times. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. That is the result. He is warning his enemies here. Depart from me because all of my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall be turned back and put to shame. Why? Well, the reason, he tells you three times, because the Lord has heard my weeping. 
because the Lord has heard my plea, because the Lord accepts my prayer. Notice that David not only appeals to God's grace for deliverance, David also places all of his hope and his trust in God. Listen, David knows because God is loving and because David belongs to God, then David can be confident that God has heard his cries and his prayers. Christian, listen. If you are in Christ Jesus, you belong to God. He is your Father. Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. God is your Father. Yes, we appeal to God based on His grace, but because of who we are in Christ, because if we are united to Christ, because we belong to Him, then we can be assured that the Lord has heard our weeping. Like He has never forgotten our cries. Like whenever we are soaking our bed or drenching our couch with our tears and crying all day and all night, like God hears, God sees those things. Because you are His child, the Lord has heard your cries. And those pleas that you have offered up, God, be gracious to me. I don't, I don't know what I have done. If I have sinned against you, Lord, forgive me, but don't discipline me. God, show me grace. Father, be with me in this moment. This is more than I can bear. Lord, how much longer do I have to exist? How much longer do I have to endure this trouble? Listen, because you belong to God, because you are a Christian, because you are united to Christ, because you are clothed in His righteousness, because you are blood-bought, you are part of the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Listen, the Lord has seen and heard your cries. The Lord has heard your pleas. The Lord has heard your pleas even if they were pleas out of a broken heart. They were so, so small and so, so weak that you thought there's no way that's getting to heaven. Listen, the Lord has heard my plea. And the Lord has accepted my prayer. Like because of who we are in Christ, because of us being united to Christ, because we are wrapped in His righteousness, we approach the throne of grace with confidence. We walk into God's throne and, and we approach Him as our Heavenly Father and we ask Him for grace in a time of need. This is exactly what David is saying. He's saying, enemies, you can keep on if you want, but you need to be warned about this. The sovereign God of the universe, He has seen my weeping. The sovereign God of the universe, He has heard my plea. The sovereign God of the universe, He has accepted my prayer. And you will be ashamed. You will be greatly troubled and you will be turned back and you will be put to shame in a moment. Look at the contrast from the beginning to the end of this psalm. I just want to show you this. Look what he says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. In verse 2, Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are trouble. Watch that. My soul also is greatly troubled. Now look down here in verse 10. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. You see, at first it was David who was troubled all the way down to his innermost being, his bones and his soul. But because God has heard his prayer, because God has accepted his prayer, now David turns and says, it will be you, my enemies, who are greatly troubled. Essentially what he is saying is, it may not look like it now, but God's people are victorious over their enemies, and their enemies will be put to shame. Now, Christ has conquered our enemies, has he not? He has conquered sin, death, and Satan. He has put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. But I want to show you something in Romans chapter 8. So turn over to Romans chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 31 through 39. And I just want you to hear this. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you are experiencing, no matter how people think about what you are going through, no matter what people are saying, listen to this. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, listen, that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of God's creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, Christian, no matter what your circumstances are, you can be assured that nothing will ever separate you from the love of our Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I just want to offer you a few practical remarks from this psalm. Just very quickly, I know that we are, are running up against the end of the time we have together. But a few practical remarks. Listen, we should acknowledge that pain and evil exist. It is not a, 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 a fairy tale. It is not something that doesn't exist. It's not something that is a product of our imagination. Listen, pain and evil exist in this world. So we should acknowledge that as Christians. But, listen, it is an intrusion into God's good creation brought about by the fall and the sinfulness of mankind. Now, related to that, God uses everything to shape us, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be pleasant. So suffering is real. God will use it, but it may be extremely painful. The second thing is, we should be honest with God about our feelings. But this is the key. We should be honest with God about our feelings, but we must lean into God in our pain not away from it. Pain has a way of, of, of doing things. Suffering has a way of doing things uh, that, that perhaps nothing else does. Suffering in our lives can, can either cause us to blame God, it can cause us to pull away from God. Now, if we're indwelt by the Spirit, we won't be able to stay that way for long. So for truly Christians, we won't stay that way for long. But initially, our suffering can cause us to push away from God or it can cause us to be open and honest with God about how bad it hurts as we lean into God. So I would advise if you are suffering today, if something is in your life that is causing you great suffering, like be open and honest with that. Be honest with God because He already knows and He cares for you. He's using that suffering. You may not be able to see it now, but He will use that suffering. But remember, lean into God, not away from God. Remember, David acknowledged that God was suffering, I mean, that God was sovereign in his suffering, but he still appealed to God for God's grace. The third thing is, we should be grieved over the sin and the pain in the world, but we must remember that these things are only temporary. This is what David did. He acknowledged that pain was real. He acknowledged that suffering was real. He acknowledged that evil was real. But by the end of the psalm, by the end of the lament that he offered, he is acknowledging that these things are not eternal, that these things won't last forever, that in the end of the matter, God's enemies will be put to shame and God's people will be vindicated. Listen, we as Christians, we understand this way better than David did in the Old Covenant. We know that Jesus has won the victory over sin, death, and Satan. And so for us, yes, we grieve over the sin and the pain in the world, but we remember that these things are only temporary. Jesus has won, and this causes us to take our hope off of things in the world, and it causes us to lift our gaze and to put our hope where it should be, in God. So these are three things that I would tell you from the psalm. psalm acknowledge that pain and evil exist, but it is an intrusion into God's creation brought about by the fall and the sinfulness of mankind. God uses everything to shape us, but it doesn't mean it's pleasant. We should be honest with God about our feelings, but we should lean into Him in our pain, not away from Him. And we should be grieved over the sin and pain in the world, but we must remember that these things are only temporary, that Jesus has won the victory. Well, I don't know where you are today. Perhaps this psalm is something that uh, you're not experiencing at the moment. You are not experiencing uh, suffering in your life. But that's okay. You know, at some point in our life, these kind of psalms, they come in uh, they come at exactly the right moment. And so I would encourage you to continue to pray through the psalms, continue to study and read the psalms, continue to think about them. And God will have a way of, of, of using these psalms in your life exactly when you need them the most. Uh, if you are suffering, listen, lean into God. Lean into God in your suffering, not away from Him. Use Psalm chapter 6 and various other psalms of lament as a vehicle for you to express to God how you are feeling and express to God how you are trusting Him even in the midst of your suffering. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, then I want to encourage you to repent of your sins and to turn away from your sins and to turn to Jesus Christ in faith for salvation. 
Because the Bible says that those who are outside of Christ, these things aren't true for you. Those who are outside of Christ, God is not your Father. God is not your uh, benevolent uh, King. He is not uh, the one who will come to your rescue. What the Bible says about people who are outside of Christ is that this God who knows all things, who is sovereign over all things, this God will be your judge. And that you will spend all of eternity suffering under His righteous wrath for the sins that you have committed. Another way to put it, if you are a Christian, this is as bad as it's going to get. But if you are not a Christian, if you are outside of Christ, then this is as good as it gets for you. The place that you will go upon your death or at the return of Christ will make this place pale in comparison to the torment that you will experience there. So as you look around at the brokenness of the world, if you are outside of Christ, as you look around at the brokenness of the world, all the pain, all the uncertainty, remember that without Christ, this is as good as it gets for you. But the good news is, is that God has made a way for us to be reconciled to Him. He hasn't left us in this position of separation and brokenness. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life. He never sinned. Then He died on the cross to pay for our sins, to pay for those things that we have done that God has told us not to. He paid for our sins. He was buried in the grave and He was raised from the dead after three days. And then after many days of appearing to many witnesses, He ascended to be with the Father where He is now. The Bible says that anyone, anywhere, at any time, who turns away from their sins, that means you are agreeing with God that your sins are wrong, turns to Jesus Christ in faith and asks for Him to save them. The Bible says He will save you. He will make you a new creation. He will give you a new family. He will give you a new destiny. He will give you a new Lord. And so if that's you today, I want to encourage you to call out for salvation. As always, I am praying for you, and I look forward to studying God's Word with you uh, in the weeks to come. Let's close our Bible study tonight with a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, God, we come to You, and God, we know that pain and suffering are real. Father, your word tells us where pain and suffering came from. It came from the fall in the garden, and it comes from our own sinfulness. And so, Father, even though our circumstances and the pain in our life may not be uh, directly caused by our own personal sin, it is indeed sin that has caused all suffering. And Father, we know that Christ came to save us from our sins. And Father, we know that He has won the victory. And that one day you will make all things right. But Father, we thank you for your grace in allowing us to have Psalm chapter 6 as a, a vehicle for us to express our honest, our broken emotions to you. Father, thank you for loving us. God, we are clay in your hands. We pray that you will mold us and that you will make us. Transform us by the renewing of our minds according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.